Now somebody say this to me, the word works. Say, the word is working mightily in my life. Come and say it one more time, the word of God is working mightily in my life. Say it one more time, the word of God has taken hold of my life and he's working mightily in my life. Say this, from glory to glory, from faith to faith, from strength to strength, from wisdom to wisdom, I will never have a better yesterday. Come on, shout it, I will never have a better yesterday. Declare it, the spirit of him that raised Jesus from the dead dwells in my body. He's a factory of life, renewing my body, strengthening me on the inside. Say this, I'm full of light. Shout it again, I'm full of light. I'm full of grace. Shout it, I'm abounding unto every good work. Shout it, every word of prophecy concerning my life is racing to fulfillment. Shout it, I am a bundle of testimonies. One more time, the word of God is working mightily in my life. It's a good time to rejoice and give him praise. Hallelujah. How many of you believe that what you said has happened? You believe that? Praise God. Hallelujah. Welcome three persons and tell them it's your month to be a glow, a glow, a glow. Now remind them. I'm still on a flight. 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 Hallelujah. Glory to God. Please, you may be seated. Hallelujah. Praise God. Hallelujah. Romans chapter 12. Romans chapter 12. And verse 11. Romans chapter 12, verse 11. Praise the Lord. Romans chapter 12, verse 11. It says, not slothful in business. Now, I want you to note that word slothful, not slothful in business. That's the King James. It says, fervent in spirit, serving the Lord. Hallelujah. Praise God. Not slothful in business, fervent in spirit, serving the Lord. Now, we've been studying from the Amplified Classic. Um, So by now, I'm sure that you can quote it by heart. Okay, not slothful in business, fervent in spirit, and what will happen? Serving the Lord. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. The first letter of Paul to the church at Thessalonica and verse 19. One of the shortest portions of the Bible. All right, it says, quench not the spirit. One translation says, extinguish not the spirit. And I think that's closest to it in the Greek, extinguish not the spirit. So the nature and the character of the spirit is as fire. Is as fire, because it's fire you extinguish. It says, extinguish not the spirit, quench not the spirit. Tells you something about the nature and the character of God's spirit. Of course, we've studied that uh, the church of Jesus Christ started in fire. But when you study it from the Old Testament and you study it in the New Testament, In the Old Testament, Exodus, the third chapter, the first verse to the fourth verse. The New Testament, Exodus chapter one, chapter three, verse one to three. In the New Testament, Acts chapter two, verse one to four. You see the origins of the church of Jesus Christ. And in both cases, the church was established by fire. God appeared unto Moses in the burning bush and the bush was um, on fire, but not consumed. 
And God spoke to Moses and gave him the commission to go deliver his children, Israel, out of Egypt. And then you study in Acts, the second chapter as well, how that the Bible tells us that the Holy Spirit filled the room and they heard the sound like as of a rushing mighty wind. And there appeared unto them cloven tongues as a fire sat on the head of each every one of them, and they speak in tongues, speak in other tongues, as the Holy Ghost gave them utterance. You read it in the Passion Translation. It says that a pillar of fire appeared in that upper room. And I think that's the closest to, because I've studied this in the Greek. I've, I've studied it from um, some of the closest manuscripts. And I think the Passion Translation gets it closest that the pillar of fire that appeared unto um, the nation Israel in the wilderness was that same pillar of fire that appeared in that upper room. And the Bible says that cloven tongues, in the King James, it says it sat on their head, but the idea is that it was a ball of fire that split into two, and each person literally has the same way you wear your um, native Agbada, something like that. Um, fire, they, they wore a garment of fire as it were. And so if you saw them in the realm of the spirit, you didn't see a bald-headed man or a dark guy or a light lady or, I mean, a six-pack guy or a one-pack fellow, whatever you have. You didn't see all of that. What you saw was fire. The signature of the believer in the realm of the spirit is fire. Glory to God. And the more we burn, because we have something to do with how we burn. How we burn is not dependent on God. It's all dependent on us. The extent to which we burn and the brighter to which we burn is all dependent on us. It's not dependent on God. God wants us to burn. He's made provision for us to burn. He wants you to burn. And it's practically impossible for you to do all the things that God has called you to do and to be all that God has called you to be without you understanding the responsibility to set yourself on fire and to stay on fire for all the days of your life. It's impossible for you to be all that God has called you to be. It was Jonathan Edwards who was asked, how come you're able to do the things that you do, the crowds drawn to you? and the kind of results that you have. And he said, I simply set myself on fire and the world comes to watch me burn. Those words have not left me. I read them. I believe I must have been in um, GSS 3 or SS 1 when I read them. He said, I simply set myself on fire and the world comes to watch me burn. Have you not noticed that if fire is burning brightly somewhere, everyone's attention is drawn to that fire. Everybody wants to know why is it burning, what's burning, what's on fire. Fire announces itself. Fire is attractive in and of itself. You see, fire is that one element that can get all that it needs to be done by itself. It's what you call the ultimate element of nature. Fire is the ultimate element of nature. Glory to God. Are you still here? Fire will destroy and it will purify at the same time. All dependent on the kind of material it's functioning on. If you put fire on wood, it will destroy wood. If you put fire on clay, it will harden clay. If you put fire on gold, it will purify gold. Same fire, different results. Glory to God. So he tells us in Leviticus, the sixth chapter, from the 12th verse to verse 13, verse 14, it shows us clearly that the responsibility to stay on fire is directly connected with our priesthood, with our priestly ministry. He shows us Leviticus, the sixth chapter. You can study from verse 12, verse 11, verse 12, and 13. It shows us clearly that the responsibility to burn and to stay on fire is directly connected with the practice of our priesthood. You doing the things that you're meant to do as a priest of the Most High God. In essence, if you will um, execute your priestly ministry and your priestly office, 
you will naturally and inevitably be on fire. What I've found out is that Satan will do any and everything to stop you from standing in your priestly ministry. Any and everything to stop you from standing in your priestly ministry. You know why? The true strength of a man is his priestly ministry that is unseen. The true measure of any believer, any Christian, any man, is not anything that you see on the external and you can measure on the external. Absolutely not. The true measure of any believer, any Christian, is their personal priesthood. And the thing with the priesthood is that the priesthood is a private office. The kingly office, the prophetic office, is a public office. The priesthood is a very private office. Nobody gets to see what you do as a priest, for the most part. But for the most part, that's what determines the trajectory of your life and the very strength of your life. By the priesthood, we mean offering up spiritual sacrifices unto God. And the Bible makes a list of these spiritual sacrifices. Meditation is a spiritual sacrifice. Fasting is a spiritual sacrifice. Psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs, that's ministering to the Lord, is a spiritual sacrifice. Consecration, that's presenting your bodies unto the Lord in holiness, is a spiritual sacrifice. Hallelujah. Your gifts, your seeds unto the Lord is a spiritual sacrifice. All of this is within your priesthood. Are you still here? And the strength of a man really is in these things, not in the external activities that everybody can measure. So Satan will fight and do everything because if he can get you out of your priesthood, then the fire will definitely go out. What happens when the fire goes out? We need to know what really happens when the fire goes out. How do you know the fire is going out? And then you know that you have to set yourself to seek the Lord and to set yourself on fire afresh. Every now and then, irrespective of who we are, we have to find the time to set ourselves on fire afresh irrespective of who we are. If you work for God long enough, the nature of our job, the nature, the demand upon our lives is such that the fire will go out if you don't give attention to it. You may still have external activities and people are still excited about you, but it's a matter of time. That's why you find certain people who you have so much rave and so much noise about them. And in the same way, there was so much rave and so much noise. They just disappear. I don't know if you know what I'm talking about. They just disappear off the scene as though they never existed. You find some people in the business world, in the secular world, make some marks um, take some huge stride and in the same way they took the huge strides and everybody celebrated them. They just fizzle off the scene. That's not to say they cease existing, but the existence is of no worth to the world anymore. It's of no worth to the world anymore. I found out that many times success is very deceptive or the idea of success is very deceptive. Progress can be deceptive. The idea of progress can be deceptive. Progress and success is such that it demands from you more time and more commitment and takes you away from the very things that produced it. It's a deceptive thing. For example, I'm a minister of the gospel and I'm spending time before the Lord in prayer. I'm spending hours just waiting on the Lord in prayer, fasting, and meditating on the word of God. Nobody knows me. 
nobody, nobody even recognizes that anybody called Aya Jani exists. I preach a wonderful message I think I heard from heaven. A few people are blessed by it and that's all. Well, I'm forced to go back into the closet since nobody knows me. It's God who knows me. So I go back to the closet and I'm praying a bit more and I spend some more hours bring my head out and see nobody knows me. And so I put my head back and I'm praying and I'm fasting and doing all the things that I know to do. Finally, somebody begins to know you. Somebody begins to call you. Now people are screaming your name here and there. Now you're excited and happy that all of a sudden your study is paying off. Somebody has been blessed. Somebody loves your song. They want you on every stage possible. Now you're so booked and so busy. And you forget that the very thing that got you booked is what the booking will take from you. Our W. Shambach said one day he was in prayer. And the Holy Spirit said to him, he said, your ministry is a measure of the time you spend with me. He said, the more time you spend with the people and the less you spend with me, the less of ministry you have. And the more time you spend with me and the less time you spend with the people, the more ministry you have. I've never forgotten those words. I've never forgotten those words. It's like a businessman. There's not much to do at the office. You have just two orders, right? In two hours, three hours, you're done with the two orders. Now you're scrolling through Google to get some new ideas and all the rest. And it's time for prayer and fasting. You have all the time to pray and fast. <laughs> In fact, you volunteer your services as an intercessor. Extraordinaire. <laughs> Praise God. You're a prayer. Conosium. Conosium. But now, your prayers have been answered. You're so booked. You have orders back to back. It's 21 days prayer and fasting. You're so in at work. You see, God has given us technology. That's why we have technology. We don't have to show up in church. It can be virtual. It's the deception of riches. That's what Jesus called it. He called it deceptiveness of riches. And it's just a matter of time. Life will test you to see what is the character of the man who's functioning at this level. Every time you show up at a certain level, life will test you. You want to know if you have the character to support what it is that you are claiming you are. Life will test you. Satan will try you. Are you following what I'm saying here? That's why it is, it is a fearful thing for a believer not to be on fire. It's a fearful thing. Are you listening to what I'm saying here? It's a very fearful thing. It's a dangerous place to be, not to be on fire. The first thing that shows up when the fire begins to go out in scriptures is called profanity. Say with me, profanity. Come on, say it with me, profanity. Hmm. The way you are saying it, there's no fire. Hmm? <laughs> say with me, profanity. Hmm. That's the first thing that shows up. When the fire begins to go out, profanity. Now, profanity in the Greek is not the same as profanity in English. So, um, profanity in English means, even though the English meaning of profane is um, as a result. I mean, so what we call profane in English happens as a result of what truly profane is. In the Greek, I'll explain what I mean here. In the Greek, when we use the word profanity, or when they, I'm not Greek, when they use the word profanity, it refers to esteeming spiritual things, kingdom things, 
heavenly things lightly. Esteeming. Now, this does not happen overnight. Are you getting what I'm saying? It doesn't. It's not that you wake up one morning and then you stop esteeming spiritual things highly. No, 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 no. A million times, no. A million times, no. It happens gradually. You begin to esteem spiritual things very lightly. The things that mattered to you and had value and had weight to you, you find out that you begin to esteem them lightly. By the way, these are signs that the fire is going out and signs that there is no fire. Are you getting what I'm saying? So maybe someone who was burning and was on fire and the fire begins to go out. These are the things we begin to see. And at the same time, it's a sign. There are signs that there's no fire and you need to get on fire for the Lord. Are you following what I'm saying here? Profanity. Let's look at Hebrews, the 12th chapter. Hebrews chapter 12 and verse 16. Hebrews chapter 12 and verse 16. Glory to God. Are you still in church? There's such a beautiful anointing of the Holy Spirit in the house this morning. And you know, when the glory of the Lord, the anointing of God's Spirit is present like this, um, there's so much He's doing, more than the eyes can see, more than the mind can fathom. All we have to learn to do is to submit ourselves to him. Tell me, what did Adam do to get Eve out of him? Would he even have believed that there was Eve on the inside of him? There's too much on the inside. If we just learn to rest in his presence. I was in prayer, I think yesterday or two days ago. And once again, I just heard the voice of the Lord. Once again, I've heard that voice several times. And then he said again, he said, son, all that you're seeking is in my presence. Oh, it was beautiful. Truly, the presence of Jesus is everything. Hallelujah. Are you still here? Mm. And the Lord Jesus is here in his presence, in his glory, in his power. And he's doing a mighty work in your heart and your life. Hallelujah. This is not a social club. This is not a social club. Look at what it says. He says, lest there be any fornicator or profane person, profane as Esau, who for one morsel of meat sold his birthright. It, it's an amazing thing. It's an amazing thing. The Spirit of God inspires you to fast. But I mean, I can do the fast tomorrow. I can just push it to you tomorrow. And he lost his birthright. Just a morsel. The same food you always ate. But he ate it at the wrong time. At the wrong time. He says, for a morsel of meat, sold his birthright. Do you remember what Esau said? That's one of the most profane statements in all of scriptures. He said, what is the birthright to me? I'm hungry, you're saying birthright. Give me food. Who was all this one to me? It's a state of mind where spiritual things have become distant to you. And the value that you once placed upon them has eroded. Are you getting what I'm saying here? There was a time when you lifted up your hands. It meant something. It meant something. When you lifted up your hands, immediately tears began to come out of your eyes. You know what I'm talking about. It meant something. Nobody had to whine you. Jesus is here. The presence of Jesus is here. Jesus is, can you feel him? Have you felt him? Nobody had to warn you. It, it meant something. He was holy. There was a time when you woke up on Sunday morning, your whole being was excited. You, you had this idea, my goodness, I'm going to church again today. And, and you're walking and you, your legs couldn't carry you as fast as you wanted it to carry you. You couldn't wait to get you the church doors. But look at you now. You even watch it on your bed with a bottle. The ones that are still being delivered. <laughs> but yeah, yeah, oh glory. I just like the way they sing in that church on your bed. Fresh fire in the name of Jesus. <laughs> Fresh fire. Are you following what I'm saying here? When spiritual things, the value that you once placed upon them are so eroded that they have become normal and natural to you. Are you following what I'm saying here? It's just normal. The lifting up of holy hands has become normal. They say lift up your hand. 
you, you, you are now so heavy. Even the tongues, even the tongues, your whole spiritual sofa goes is full of fat. The whole infrastructure. Come wow. <laughs> Glory to God. Before they told you to lift your hands and pray, you were, you were, you were, you were everywhere. Everywhere. In fact, they used to move for you. They will move away like this. Ah, yeah, ah, ah, better can start it. They will move for you. But now they can stay with you. Shalomo. Oh, man, to kill me. It is not maturity. Is profanity. You have lightly esteemed the presence of the monarch of the universe. It has become casual and normal to you. It has become casual and normal to you. Can I ask you a question? When last did you cry in worship? When last? Now, now, you are now the professor of the types of tears. Say that one. It's not holy or that one is conviction tears. I, I know that here. You, you, you actually, you are there, you are standing. Man, stop from Monoma. You are there. Now, you are, you are the assistant Holy Spirit. You are looking everywhere. Ah, yes, I can see the cloud coming. I can see it. It's coming. Why did it stop there? In chem, in chem. But those days, you were so lost. They will have to, we have finished worshipping, we have finished worshipping. Till you leave. But now you are prima and proper. You are even catwalking. The Holy Ghost has not hit you since. Your leg is still normal. Go and ask John the Apostle. Was he not the one who laid his head on the bosom of Jesus? And said, this is the one, the apostle whom, the disciple whom the Lord loveth. When he saw this Jesus on the island of Patmos, he said his legs buckled. He couldn't stand. He said, I looked into his eyes. They were like fire. He says there was a sword coming out, a two-edged sword coming out of his mouth. He saw something. Everything changed. Are you following what I'm saying here? Profanity. Profanity. Where we lightly esteem Spiritual things. And that's how a lot of people lose out on what God has for them. You know, it was this honor relationship, honoring and esteeming spiritual things highly, that led Abraham into his destiny and his inheritance. He saw two kings. He saw the king of, um, what's he called? Sodom. And then he saw the king of Salem. But he recognized that one was the priest of the Most High God. So what did he do? Both of them were kings. You see, honor is a differentiation. A recognition of value. It's a differentiation, a recognition of value. They're both kings, but there's something about this one. So what did he do? He gave seed to the poor, to the king of Sodom. That's what he did. What did he do to the king of Salem? The priest of the Most High God. He said, this is the priest of God. He took the tithe. And he offered it up unto Melchizedek. Melchizedek did not demand the tithe. He recognized this is an opportunity. It's an opportunity. So he took the 10%, the tenth, and gave it to Melchizedek. Then he said, well, I've lifted up my hands to the God of heaven that no man shall be able to say he has made Abraham rich. So king of Sodom, take the remaining 90. They rightfully belong to me. But I think you need to go back and build your kingdom and your cities so you can have the remaining. Why did he give to this one what was left? Why did he first separate a tent to give to this one a recognition of value? Are you following what I'm saying? When we lose our perception, when our perception of value begins to erode, what happens is that we treat everything the same way. Are you following what I'm saying? You treat going to church like you treat going to work. You treat it all the same way. Because value has been lost. The thing with fire is, fire helps you discern value. It helps you respond aright to value. 
That's what happens. Spiritual values. It helps you. It helps you. So the first thing, or one of the first things that begins to disappear or begins to win, when the fire begins to, um, uh, it's burning out, is profanity begins to increase. Profanity begins to increase. Number two, because this profanity would lead to something else, and this is very instructive. It is called slothfulness. Slothfulness. And I, I need you to please understand what I'm talking about. It's called slothfulness, not laziness. Let me start out by saying slothfulness in scriptures and laziness are not the same thing. Same thing. I remember having a session with, um, I th- was it a pastor or so? And, and I was trying to um, run them through this. Slothfulness and laziness are not the same thing. You see, laziness is you not living up to your expectations, living up to what is expected of you and what is demanded of you. Are you following what I'm saying here? That's what it is. That's what laziness is, which means this is expected of you. This is demanded of you based on where you are, um, what you're doing, um, the age of life, the responsibilities, the stage of life, and you're not living up to it. That's laziness. Are you getting what I'm saying here? So you see a lazy man and then they say, um, he, he wakes up late. He doesn't show up at the right time and all the rest. But slothfulness does not mean you're lazy. In fact, a slothful man many times is a very diligent man. He's a very diligent man. And I'm going to explain what I mean very soon. Slothfulness is more of an internal attitude than an external action. Laziness is an external action, which means we look at what he's doing or he's not doing, and we say, this person is lazy. But slothfulness, and this is why it takes the Spirit of God to shine the light on your soul, to bring it to the fore, to let you know. Are you following what I'm saying here? To let you know. The Lord had to deal with me about it at some point. To let you know that, hey, you're not lazy, but you're getting slothful. Slothful is when you have lost that initial zest passion, enthusiasm. Are you following what I'm saying here? The zeal with which you did a thing in times past. Now, it's not saying you have stopped doing it. Are you getting this? It's not saying that, hey, you are now so lazy, you're not doing it anymore. That's not what he's saying. He's saying behind the action, we can't find the enthusiasm We can't find the commitment. We can't find the zeal and the passion with which you did what you did before. We know you're still doing it. You're still showing up. Are you getting what I'm saying here? Yeah, you're still showing up. You're still ticking the register. If anybody's asked, they ask, who are the three people we can say are very committed to this? Your name will be mentioned. You see that? But then we can't find, and that's why it's a personal thing. The Holy Spirit has to, Reveal it to you that you're showing up, but you are not showing up. Oh, you didn't get what I said. (laughs) You're showing up. Everybody can see you. The pastor can show up without showing up. You know you can preach so much that you just become a preaching machine. Saturday, what are we going to see on Sunday? Okay. This one or that one? Okay, I'll use that example. Scatter them. <laughs> you can't. I mean, you can become such a preaching machine that you're just going from one meeting to another. Eh, give me that note from 2003. Just put it together. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You preach a powerful message. People are blessed, but you know you are not showing up. The passion and the enthusiasm with which you did what you did before is now lost. Hebrews the sixth chapter. I want to show you a few scriptures here. Are you being blessed this morning? Hebrews chapter six and verse twelve. Slothfulness refers to neutrality. It refers to passionlessness. You're neutral. You're present but neutral. Hebrews chapter six verse twelve. I want you to observe this. He says that you be not slothful, but followers of them who through faith and patience. Inherit the promise. He didn't say that you be not lazy. In fact, the best way to explain slothfulness would be what Jesus said about the church at Laodicea. Lukewarmness. 
You see, lukewarmness, and you need to understand, okay, okay, the Spirit of the Lord would have me um, explain. Revelation 3, let's look at it, verse 14. Revelation 3, verse 14. Um, let me explain it to you. Let, let me show you that. Revelation 3 and verse 14, we'll look at it in the King James, and then we'll look at it in the Passion and the Message Translation. We read to about verse 19, verse 20. It says, And unto the angel of the church of Laodiceans write, This thing saith the Amen. Now, please note, the message is first to the angel. That's the pastor. So, when you read these messages, God is first speaking to the pastor himself. And then, he's taking this message to the church. So, the messages many times have a personal application and then they have a corporate application. Are you following what I'm saying here? This is important. All right. It says, this thing yet the amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. Ain't this beautiful? Now, verse 15. It says, I know thy works. Do you observe that they had works? Observe this. He wasn't saying they were not doing anything. Look at where he starts from. He said, I know your works. You're still singing in choir. I know your works. You are still giving your tithe every month. I know your works. Look at it. He says, I know your works. So the issue, he wasn't contending with them not doing what they should do. That's what the issue was contending with. He says, I know your works that thou art neither cold nor hot. He says, listen, I would prefer that you are totally cold or hot, not in between, not neutral. Are you getting what I'm saying here? Okay, I would rather that your coat or your heart. Look at the next verse there, verse 16. This will bless you. So then, because thou art lukewarm, and neither cold nor heart, because if you're cold, I will stay with you till you get it. If your heart will have a party together, it tells you God's disgust with slothfulness and lukewarmness. He says, I will spoo thee out of my mouth. A lot of people don't understand what he's talking about here. I've seen a lot of um, mis misinformed, confused young folks who try to teach and then, um, because they've not been taught God's word well and haven't studied these things line upon line, they say things like, you know, um, Jesus cannot spoo us out of his mouth and all this. First things first, do you even know what he's talking about? He's not talking about a literal and all this, no rest. Let me give you the context. This church is the church of Laodicea. And Laodicea was a city um, in between two other cities. You had Hierapolis on, one, on the one side, which was six miles away from Laodicea. And you had Colossae. So um, when Paul writes to the church in Colossae, it includes Hierapolis. It includes Laodicea. And this church here at Laodicea, because it was like a region. Not just one, so all the churches in Hierapolis, in Laodicea, and in Colossae all together were referred to either as the Colossian church, that's the letter to the Colossians, or referred to as the church in Laodicea, whatever name, um, it's like northern region. And so you say Kaduna and Abuja. All right, but they were not that far apart. So you had six miles away, Hierapolis on this side, and Colossae about, um, said to be about 10 miles away from Laodicea. Now, in Hierapolis, it was um, a volcanic city. Um, um, you had what you call dormant volcanoes in Hierapolis. So you have um, hot water springs. They had a lot of hot water springs in Hierapolis because they had dormant volcanoes there. And on the other side, interestingly, in Colossae, they had um, very cold lakes in Colossae. So people would travel from Laodicea, Sometimes just to go enjoy the warm, hot, the water springs in Hierapolis, or they go this other way to enjoy the cold, but Laodicea had nothing by itself. So the Romans came up with an engineering idea and said, let's get the hot water from Hierapolis and get the cold water from Colossae and create an aqueduct or a lake or whatever it is where both of them meet and we can have something in between and you don't have to travel this way or travel that way are you getting what i'm saying here the problem however is before the waters from hierapolis got to laodicea they were cold are you getting what i'm saying here 
Albeit not as cold as the waters coming from Colossae. So by the time you, <laughs> you were in Laodicea and you dipped into the pool, it wasn't anything like either of both of them. The, this was the cold that Jesus was talking about. So you have to understand that they understood exactly what he was saying in pictures. Because they knew that Colossae had cold water. Are you getting this? And people sometimes will go there in summer just to cool themselves off. Are you getting what I'm saying here? And then when it was really cold, people will go to this other side to warm themselves up. Are you following this here? So people actually wanted it either hot or cold. Not in between. So when Jesus said, you are lukewarm. I'd rather have you cold or hot. They knew what he was talking about. Because there was a failed project in Laodicea at the time. Are you getting this here? Now, another thing that happened was that the pipes, because this was um, centuries ago, the pipes with which they um, 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 got the waters to, um, what's it called now, Laodicea, um, released substances and chemicals into the water. So it was not as natural and pure like you had it, in, by the time you got here, once you dipped in, or you took a sip, or you smelled the water, it was pungent. Are you following what I'm saying here? So when Jesus said, I will spew you out of my mouth, he was the picture of the guy who wanted to just dip in the water. Oh my God, what is this? They knew what he was talking about. It made a mental image on their minds that the same way you resented being inside these waters, Jesus resents such a believer. Are you following what I'm saying? Made such a mental, it was a clear image on your minds. Now look at what he says next. Go on with me. Are you getting anything this morning? Look at verse 17. He says, because thou seest I am rich and increased with goods. So where is the problem coming from? The progress, the success, the blessings. You see that? He says, and have need of nothing. Knowest not that thou art wretched and miserable and poor and blind and what? Naked. Verse 18. I counsel thee to buy of me gold tried ware in the fire that thou mayest be rich and white remain that thou mayest be clotted and that the shame of your nakedness do not appear and anoint thine eyes with eyes of that thou mayest see. Verse 19. Run with me. It says, as many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Be zealous, therefore, and repent. We're going to come to how to mitigate against these things in just a bit. Can I have this in the Passion Translation, please? In the Passion Translation, verse 14 in the Passion Translation. I just want you to see one or two thoughts there. Revelation 3 and verse 14. Glory to God. All right. It says, write the following to the messenger of the congregation in Laodicea, for these are the words of the Amen, the faithful, true witness, the ruler of God's creation. Next verse, quickly. I know all that you do, and I know that you are neither frozen in apathy, nor fervent with passion. Do you see that? You know there are lots of believers like that. They are not frozen with apathy. Neither are they fervent with passion. It says, how I wish you were either one or the other. I prefer it. Look at it. But because you are neither cold nor hot, but look, I am about to spit you from my mouth. Next verse. It says, for you claim I am rich and getting rich. I don't need a thing. Yet you are clueless that you are miserable, poor, blind, barren, and naked. Next verse. <laughs> so I counsel you to purchase gold perfected by fire so that you can be truly rich. Purchase a white garment to cover and clothe your shameful Adam nakedness. Purchase eye salve to place over your eyes so that you can truly see. Verse 19, all those I dearly love, I unmask and train. You see that? It says, if I truly love you, I will unmask you. How many of you feel unmasked this morning? You are, you are trying to hold it. It's not me. It's Phoebe they are talking about. It's not me. <laughs> so repent and be eager to pursue what is right. Can I have the message translation? I just want you to see these thoughts in some more... Um, expressive um, translations there. All right. Right to Laodicea, to the angel of the church. It says, God's yes, the faith, on and on. Can we go to verse 15 quickly? Verse 15. 
I know you inside out and find little to my liking. You are not called. <laughs> Is this New Testament? Da -da 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 -da. Is this New Testament? Brother Musa, is this New Testament? <laughs> okay, it's End Testament. <laughs> it's, it's, you're not hot. Far better to be either cold or hot. You are stale. You are stagnant. You are stale. It's yesterday's grace you are still carrying about. You are stale. Stale bread. You are sinking. You are smelling like, like stale bread. Stale. Just do like this. You are stale. You are stale. Just do like that. Don't point to anybody. You are stale. You are stale. <laughs> Make sure your pointing does not reach anybody. He <laughs> says, you're stale. You're stagnant. You make me want to vomit. <laughs> Somebody is countering the word of God with the word of God. I'm the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. I'm beloved. I'm accepted. I can hear your heart. I can hear your heart. You are, you are, you are saying God forbid to God. Believers, Christians. Sometimes I just imagine that God sits down in heaven and he has a good laugh. He said, This is my children. That's why he's always laughing. I agree. I agree. You can imagine because I heard somebody's, I heard your heart. I heard what you were saying. Like, mm -mm. I'm beloved. I'm accepted. I'm the right. <laughs> still, still. You're stagnant. You make me want to vomit. You brag, I'm rich. I've got it made. I need nothing from everyone. Oblivious that in fact you're a pitiful blind beggar. Tread bare and homeless. You know that's the kind of thing you just say, drop mic. <laughs> Here's what I want you to do. Buy your gold from me. There's a gold that comes from your relationship with the Lord. It's not Gucci. It's not Zara. Are you hearing what I'm saying here? He says, buy your gold from me. This gold that you are, you are being proud of. He says, this gold that's making you feel like you have need of nothing. He says, this gold has an expiry date. Buy your gold of me. He says, gold that's been through the refiner's fire. Then you'll be rich. Buy your clothes from me. Clothes designed in heaven. You've gone around half naked long enough. Buy medicine for your eyes from me. So you can see, really see. Look at the next verse. It says, the people I love, I call to account. God is calling you to account this morning. It's time to wake up. Tell the person beside you, please wake up. Wake up. Wake up. It says, prod and correct and guide so that they will live at their best. Now turn to the person beside you and read these words to them. Want to go up on your feet. Then... Some of you are still sitting there. You are saying, up on your feet. You are doing like this. Up on your feet. Look at it. Say with me. Up on your feet. Then, about face, run after God. <laughs> My God. It says, run after God. Hmm. My God. Run after God. It's time to go for him again. Is somebody listening to what I'm saying here? You remember how you used to fast and pray? You remember, right? It's time to do more. It's time to do more. Glory to God. Sit down for a bit. Sit down for a bit. So you get the idea of being slothful, right? The works are still there. But the attitude, the passion, the zeal, the zest, the enthusiasm is all gone. We maintain a show but lack the inspiration. Are you following what I'm saying here? And it says, God wants you to correct that. He wants you to correct that. Hallelujah. Just a few more scriptures around slothfulness that will help you. Proverbs 19, 15. You can write this down, and if we, the media guys can help us with it. Ecclesiastes chapter 10 and verse 18. Hallelujah. Slothfulness is far more. Proverbs 19.15. Slothfulness casteth into a deep sleep. Into a deep sleep. If you read Ecclesiastes chapter 10 verse 18, it says, true slothfulness, the building decayeth. 
You don't know it, but everything just begins to die. Everything just begins to die through slothfulness. One day, life then places a demand on you. And you can't find the strength to reply. And you're wondering, what happened? It's like Samson, he said, he wished not that the Spirit of God had left him. You remember that? The Bible says that he shook himself as other times. It's like you just say, in the name of Jesus. And you're not getting the result you used to get. You're wondering what has happened. He shook himself as at other times. Hallelujah. By much slothfulness, it says the building decayed. Praise God. Now, slothfulness is more dangerous than laziness. Laziness is just a correction and adjustment of um, attitudes and all the rest. And is external. But slothfulness is on the inside. It's much more dangerous. I'll give us the answer to all of these issues. How we move past all of this. And rekindle the fire of God's spirit in our hearts in just a bit. But let me give you the last one. Well, not the last one, but just for this service, for this morning. Let me just give you one more th thought. Have you been blessed? Yes, sir. All right. Just one more thought this morning. Canality, that's the third thing that begins to show up when the fire um, is waning. Canality. The first I told is profanity. You esteem spiritual things lightly. And then that leads you to what? Slothfulness. Because you're esteeming it lightly. Well, sometimes because of the demands and the expectations, you continue with the show, but you're not showing up. You get what I'm saying here? After a while, um, what begins to happen in your life is carnality. And I'll explain what I mean by this. It takes a life on fire to stay consecrated. It takes a life on fire to stay consecrated. Carnality is such that you begin to give excuses for the very things your conscience prodded you about yesterday. The things that your conscience told you was not right. This is not appropriate. You see, because a, a pure conscience is a law unto every man. Please write that down. A pure conscience, your pure conscience is your law. You have to understand that even before we get saved, every man has a conscience. And people who did not receive the message of the gospel will be judged by the law of their conscience, not the law of the gospel. The people who lived and died and never heard that Jesus came. The people in the world today who've not heard, who, who, they've not heard about Jesus. <laughs> I was in my 600 level medical school and this, there's this thing you do where you go to some um, communities and all the rest. And I, I, was, I was thrown all the way to Ekbe and it was inside, inside at the time. This was years ago. I mean, everybody's buying land there now, but at the time, you ran. <laughs> so we're in a village. And so one of those evenings, I remember I just called a couple of my friends. I mean, my body was just, how would I just be here now? I said, let's go, let's go, let's go. So we went to Winsouls. And um, my English was, my Yoruba was not that good. You know, there's a way when you want to speak it intentionally. The thing will intentionally hold you. You know what I'm saying? Eh? So, I, I, so I called a couple of my friends and we went and so I'll speak the interpreter and all the rest. So we asked one of them, have you heard of Jesus before? This was what the lady said. She said, is he a brand of coke? She kokni. She biti kokni. That's what she said in Yoruba. She biti kokni. Ekbe, Lagos. I could not sleep that night. Ekbe, Lagos. She had never heard the name Jesus. She biti kokni. She thought it was another soft drink. Some of you are shocked. The people that have not heard Jesus in this world. T.L. Osborne said something. He said it is criminal to preach the gospel twice to one person when some have not heard it once. He said the church needs to go out and win the world. Thank God for rain conference. Hallelujah. It's harvest time. Praise God. It's harvest time. Hallelujah. Are you still here? So, God would judge those kind of people by what is called the law of the conscience. In Romans, the first chapter, he teaches how he's going to do that. He said, everything in nature speaks to the glory of God. He says, when you look at nature, you can tell there's a God out there. Romans, the first chapter. And then, God has placed the conscience, the human conscience in every man as a moral compass and a guide. Are you getting what I'm saying? This is important. When carnality begins to set in, your conscience becomes seared. 
Are you following what I'm saying? And by being seared, we mean that the very things that your conscience um, would have given you a check about. And I need you to check your life. Your conscience would have given you a check about it. And you'd have made some adjustments. Now, you're okay. You see that? You're okay. That's, that's how you begin to enter into carnality. You're okay. Can I tell you now the dangerous place you can get to? Where what you used to be pricked about, you start explaining away. And you even find scriptures to explain it. I hope you know that. You can support anything from the Bible. You can support anything from the Bible. Satan supported his mission and his ministry from the Bible. Satan got his mission statement from the Bible. <laughs> Praise God. Hallelujah. Whatever you are finding in this book, you see it. If you are looking for how to support and say, well, you know, the LGBTQ community, and you will find it. You'll find it there. Anything you are looking for, you'll find. Praise God. Romans 8, 5 to 8 talks about carnality. Explaining that carnality is first in the mind before it's an action. For to be carnally minded, not to be carnal, but to be carnally minded is death. He didn't say for you to be carnal. A lot of believers miss it here. So he's talking about an erosion of values and principles on the inside of yourself. And so you begin to permit things that naturally your conscience would have served as a gate to ensure I don't cross this line. You find out that all of a sudden your goalpost is shifting. Your standards are shifting. Are you getting what I'm saying here? Your standards are shifting. Your conscience has become seared. That's what happens when the fire is burning out. You see, because the stronger the fire of the spirit, the greater the demand for consecration. The stronger the fire of the spirit, the greater the demand for consecration. Glory to God. The question then is, what must we do? What must we do? In all of this, and I wish I had the time to show you scripture upon scripture. In all of this, there is one thing that must be done. And I think because a lot of people haven't studied it in God's word, you know there are many times we demonize certain themes in God's word. For example, until we taught mercy, some people, many people, many believers have gotten mails from everywhere around the world, practically everywhere. I've gotten mails from Europe. I've gotten from everywhere saying, I never saw the mercy of God this way. And I thought to myself, I said, really? I knew this over a decade ago. I thought everybody knew it. And the Lord said to me, that's why you've got to preach. That's why you've got to preach. Not everybody knows it. And guess what? There's something somebody else knows that everybody does not know. Because we all know in parts. Hallelujah. Praise God. The, the answer to all of this is called repentance. Repentance. And I want to give you a working definition of repentance today. This is important. It's important that your definitions are accurate so that your pursuit can be right. Many times when people think of repentance, what we think of is godly sorrow. But observe this. It says godly sorrow work at what? Repentance. Come on, talk to me. Have you ever studied that before? He said, godly sorrow work at repentance. So godly sorrow is not repentance. There is godly sorrow and there's condemnation and grief. Are you getting what I'm saying here? Godly sorrow is as a result of the convicting ministry of the Holy Spirit on the believer. Condemnation and grief is as a result of the condemning ministry of the devil on the believer, whichever one he chooses. Are you following what I'm saying here? Let me explain the difference between both of them today. Godly sorrow, which comes from the Holy Spirit, will point you to who you are. Are you following what I'm saying here? And the sorrow comes from you falling from who you are and not aligning with what is rightfully yours and who you truly are. That's where the sorrow comes from. That's why it's called sorrow. Condemnation, on the other hand, does not refer you to who you are. It refers to you to what you did. There's a difference. Is somebody getting what I'm saying? Condemnation, the focus of condemnation is to keep, both of them are sorrow. 
There's godly sorrow, there's evil sorrow. Both of them is sorrow. One of them is sorrow because you, you see yourself in the light of what you have done and can't see yourself beyond it. Are you getting what I'm saying here? Hmm. Let's imagine you, <laughs> you, you do something wrong or whatever it is. Um, maybe you tell a lie or fornicate or whatever it is. Anytime you come in the environment of such words, Satan reminds you of your fault and your errors and shows you how you can never be certain things in God again. How many of you know what I'm talking about? You see maybe a couple holding their hands or you see somebody telling his testimony of integrity, how God has blessed him so much because of the integrity that God has helped him to uphold. And then you tell yourself, well, you see, you see how you have messed up and this can never be your testimony. That's Satan. Are you getting what I'm saying here? But godly sorrow points you to what is possible in God. Are you getting what I'm saying? Here? Now, even though that's not what I wanted to explain, here's what I wanted to explain. Um, and and I'm, I'm rushing through all of this at the risk of leaving you halfway with some things. But the Holy Spirit will explain to you, you're getting it right, you're getting it, so I'm good, I can go on. I don't have to stay on this, I can go on. Thank you, he said I can go on. All right. <laughs> Godly sorrow walk at repentance. Godly sorrow is not repentance. The problem many times is people think once I am sorrowful and I string a few words, I have repented. No, you have not. You haven't. Let me give you a working definition of repentance this morning that will bless you. Mm. It is an acknowledgement of wrong. It has to start from there. An acknowledgement of wrong. Now, but this is, the, this is the key thing about repentance because the Greek word repentance is the Greek word metanoem, which means meta means the top. Are you following what I'm saying? It's, a, it's a, um, two words joined together in the Greek. Meta means the top and the other word means a turning around. Are you following what I'm saying? It means a turning around. So repentance is an action. You have to understand this. Repentance is an action. It's not a prayer. Is somebody listening to what I'm saying? Repentance is an action. It's not a prayer. It can start as prayer, but it's not just prayer. So it's an acknowledgement of wrong followed up immediately with quality decisions and adjustments. Did you hear what I said? It is an acknowledgement of wrong, but followed up immediately with this quality decisions and adjustments in actions. So let's take the example of what we're referring to here. And we can use different scenarios. But let's use this matter of spiritual fire. You realize that my fire is going out. What are the actions, the quality decisions I must take? So when he says, repent, Revelations of Thought chapter, the 18th and 19th verse. When he told them to repent, what did he mean? He didn't mean just come and be crying. I'm sorry, Lord. I've never, I'll never do it again. I will always be on fire. You see, you can do that. That's why we sing certain songs and people go back to the same things. I have made you to smile my eyes. We sing all those songs. Um, 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 you're the God of several chances. We sing all those songs and we go back to those same things. Because two key things here. Three key things, pardon me. Number one, it's an acknowledgement of the wrong. Number two, followed up by quality decisions and adjustments in actions while laying hold on grace that is available for the situation. This is important. Please listen carefully to this. It is an acknowledgement of the wrong in the matter at hand, followed up by quality decisions. What are you never going to touch again? What are you never going to do again? What are you going to do? What rhythm and schedule are you going to put in place? Are you following what I'm saying here? You see, you can't steal and go to God and say, Lord, I am sorry I stole and that's the end of it. That's just godly sorrow. There must be an adjustment. What are the adjustments you must put in place to ensure that stealing is a matter of the past? Because repentance is always a verb. There's an action that comes with it. Now, so that you don't get legalistic, you must lay hold 
on the grace of God that is available in that situation. Can somebody listen to what I'm saying? That's what repentance is. And that's the first step to finding your spiritual fire. That's the first step. Number two, I'll give you just one or two more. And um, we'll pray. Number two, repair your altar. I said this last week, repair your altar. First Kings chapter 18, I believe the 10th verse. First Kings 18 verse 10, repair your altar. Tell the person beside you, it's time to repair your altar. What were you doing before that sustained your fire? Go back to it. Are you following what I'm saying? Repair your altar. The prophets of Baal had messed up the altar of God. The Bible says that Elijah then brought them together and says, now it's time to repair the altar. He repaired the altar before putting a sacrifice on it. So repair your altar. By repairing your altar, we're talking about um, disciplines that you must put in place. Consistent routines. Are you following what I'm saying here? Fire must be sustained by consistent practices. Morning by morning, the priest shall put wood. Are you following this here? Repair your altar. Repair your altar. And lastly, I'll give you this third one today. Company with fire. Did you hear what I said? Yeah. Find people of fire. A company with them. Don't find people around you that make you comfortable where you are. Do you understand what I'm saying? Not people that you are with and you are just comfortable. All of you are very, very lukewarm together. And you're enjoying each other's lukewarm, lukewarm meaty. <laughs> if there's any word like that, praise the Lord. Company with fire. Don't say that sister's zone is too much. Why are they? You say, Pastor said it's 21 days fasting. We will pray one, one hour. Why are they doing VG? VG. Ah! Mm. You heard that they are doing a video. Shouldn't you have asked where? Even if you will sleep half. We know you will sleep half. But at least you are in an environment of fire. At some point you wake up. I don't know what carry me here. Bye, bye. Praise God. I have found out that fire is contagious. Are you getting what I'm saying here? I found out that fire is very contagious. The more I company with people of fire, the greater the fire in my life gets. Lift your two hands towards heaven and bless him and worship him this morning. Glory to God. Woo, hallelujah. Somebody bless the name of the Lord this morning. You're blessed this morning? Yep. What are the decisions you have to make? Go ahead. And begin to pray in the spirit this morning. Thank you, Holy Spirit. Thank you, Holy Spirit. Hallelujah. Praise God. For the next one minute, lift your two hands towards heaven and just pray in the Holy Spirit. Just pray in the Holy Spirit for the next one minute. For the next one minute, pray in the Holy Spirit. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Glory to God. Glory to God. Glory to God. For the next one minute, please go ahead and pray in the Holy Spirit. Yes, we bless you, Jesus. We bless you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Who's repenting this morning? You have your new definition of repentance. Yep. What are the adjustments you need to make in your life? Go ahead. You have 30 seconds more. Just go ahead and pray. Go ahead and pray in the Spirit. Go ahead and pray in the Spirit. Thank you, Lord. Lord, we bless you. Lord, we thank you. Hallelujah. Praise God. In the name of the Lord Jesus, we have prayed. Amen. Were you blessed this morning? Glad you came to church. 